Thank you all for joining us. My name is Otis Noble III. I'm the Assistant Director in the Division of Social Sciences, and you are here with us on LA Social Science. I have the pleasure, the honor, uh, man, it's, uh, it's often uh, a blessing to speak to the amazing faculty, staff, and students we have here at UCLA. But this is a special one because I get to speak to one of those scholars who I think is, you know, doing amazing work um, within the UCLA community. Um, I'm just going to stop it because I'm going to go on and on because his brother is bad. Um, welcome, Dr. Scott Brown. Hey there, how you doing, brother Otis? It's a pleasure to be here. So, Dr. Brown, it's great to talk to you. Um, going through the pandemic, uh, you know, I, I, a lot that I've, you know, had a chance to see going on with you. Um, but before we get into it, there's a question I always love to ask. Um, the question that I've been asking a lot of our faculty and staff and students that I've gotten a chance to have a conversation with here on LA Social Science, the e um, is, is there a book or music that has helped you get through this pandemic? Oh, yeah. There's a lot of um, really, you know, good music that's sort of like... Uh, almost like therapy for me. Um, and you can pretty much drop the needle down on any cut by earth, wind and fire mm. and find a message uh, that helps give you clarity on what's going on and where you want to go. The other artist uh, is um, of course, one of the phenomenal musical prophets, um, Stevie Wonder. Mm. Uh, let's do a lot of Stevie Wonder now. I also listen to uh, a lot of Aretha Franklin. Um, mm especially, you know, you know, say a little prayer for you and all that really serious soul music, because with here, just hearing not just what she's saying, but also how she's saying it, it just gives you that sense of elevation of getting outside of what is and yeah. into what's possible. Yes. No, I just, uh, I just got introduced to the documentary that um, Sister Aretha Franklin did, recorded here in Los Angeles at yes. one of our churches and right. I, I tell you if when i'm down and out that is one that always gets me up right yeah yeah amazing grace oh yeah so so dr brown tell us about the connection because you are a, a faculty member with appointments both in african-american studies and in history so yes. i'm really wor wondering about that uh, connection between music and scholarship how, how do you bring those two together well, it's funny because I grew up playing in bands as a young person. And uh, even when I did my first book uh, called Fighting for Us on mm -hmm. the group that started the, highlight, the uh, Kwanzaa, uh, the US organization started by uh, Maulana Karenga, uh, that uh, book still has a lengthy section on when jazz artists started to utilize the ideas of the Nguzo Saba or Seven Principles and Herbie Hancock took on the name M. Wandishi mm. at one mm. point. And so I was already sort of gesturing in that direction. In fact, one of the chapters in that book is called In the Face of Funk, the Us Organization and Arts of War. So I was using it thematically. But once I started to think about my forthcoming projects and thinking about really some of the areas in Black studies, that need to be expanded. You think about one of the most important resources in the African experience and black diasporic experience. Mm -hmm. One of those resources is not coming up out of the ground, it's coming out of the souls of the people and that's music. Right. And like the resources in the ground, the resource of our music coming out of our soul is still in a kind of colonial relationship with respect to who it generates wealth for. Mm -hmm. That our music makes everybody else rich mm -hmm. um, in a way that's very disproportionate yes. to the communities that created. So the decolonization or the nationalization project that Black nations and Black communities have had to do around resources like oil. Yeah we have yet to do with culture. Mm -hmm. And so I see black studies as the discipline that doesn't just talk about notes and chords. We actually talk about 
the power dynamic mm -hmm. and all of these positions in music and distribution that are not seen in the music video. Mm -hmm. The kinds of things that people, pioneers like Don Cornelius understood about music yeah. or Dick Griffey, right? Or Sylvia Robinson. Mm -hmm. Those folks understood this other aspect. And so I see Black Studies as intervening uh, in that political context by empowering people to change that dynamic. Yeah. See, that this is why I enjoy the opportunity. Thank you, doctor, for that piece. We're going to keep it rolling, though, because you talked a little bit about your book, Fighting for Us, but tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, the first book was, that was actually my, uh, I started that when I was in graduate school collecting. I met, um, I used to read a lot of books from the bookstore in my hometown, Rochester, New York. It was called Kitabu Kingdom, mm -hmm. uh, run by his brother, Gerald Shaka, and his wife, Terry Shaka. And I would go there and just pick up all these books, and the store owner said, when you're serious about studying, you're going to study Dr. Karenga. Mm -hmm. I said, Dr. Karenga? Yeah, he started Kwanzaa. So the idea that an organization started a holiday was a bit much for me. Yeah. Then I, to believe, but then I started researching that I realized they had this conflict with the Black Panther Party. And I said to myself, if I ever get a PhD, I'm going to write the story of that organization because it, it's got to now. Little did I know what I would be getting into because, you know, there's a lot of oh, yeah. problematic things. And as a scholar, as a Black Studies scholar, yeah. as a historian, one of the first things we have to be clear about is why we're doing what we are doing. Yeah. And telling the truth, as difficult and painful and even um, self-critical as it might be, we have to tell it. So yeah. that book, Fighting for Us, deals with a very sectarian situation in the sense that there are organizations that are fighting one another. I feel proud that I got close to the truth as I could because people who are diehard haters of the Us organization mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. don't like the book because I said some good things about the Us organization. <laughs> People who are diehard us organization and Karenga followers don't yeah. like the book yeah. because I point out some of the problems and contradictions. So right. that's where, you know, we have to be comfortable being in that space. Um, yeah. That was the first book. And one of the artists who um, has become a kind of a musical mentor to me, James M. Tume, who did the song Juicy Fruit. Mm. Well, and Tume, I interviewed because he was in the Us organization. Right. And right. we started talking, and then he pointed out to me, keep playing and keep writing music because you need it. That is your, that is your place to go. That is your shield mm -hmm. out here. Because mm -hmm. academia, politics, black studies, that's like warfare sometimes. Yes. Battle. Yes. <laughs> you know, sometimes. Yes. Um, and you got to have some place that's creative and re-energizing, and that's what music has been. And that came out of the US organization project, that uh, relationship I've had with James and Two Man. Wow, wow. Well, I, you know, when you said Juicy Fruit, I'm my feet started moving. That was one of my skating songs right there, boy. Yeah, it's a roller skate song. Yeah, <laughs> when I was uh, doing it. And then when I got to know him, then I discovered that he's the writer, co-writer of um, Closer I Get to You, um, Berta Flack and Donnie Hathaway, Stephanie Mills, mm -hmm. What You Gonna Do With My Loving, mm -hmm. Phyllis mm -hmm. Hyman, You Know How to Love Me, mm -hmm. all that's Sim Tume and Reggie Lucas. So there, there, I started to, by researching the US organization, build an awareness that there's a deeper story about black music that needs to be told as well, that isn't simply getting into the sound Right. But the backstories and the politics. Right. Which is kind of a lead into um, the upcoming research that you're doing uh, that has a base in Dayton, correct? Yeah. Um, and right. and I, I love that because I, I spent some time in that Dayton area, I, you know, went to Central State University. So tell us a little bit about this uh, upcoming research that focuses around yeah. on Dayton. The book has been taking me forever to write because I've interviewed everybody and anybody and I, and I care so much about it. This is actually um, a good lesson <laughs> for those 
upcoming scholars. Right, right. It's important to care about your work. And there is something, there is a problem of caring too much in the sense that sometimes it slows, it slows down the ability to get things done and bring completion. But I've fortunately been able to do enough other things while I'm doing this. But um, this is a book about the city. I, I figured out that my three favorite bass players, and mm -hmm. I'm a bass player, yeah. um, were Marshall Jones from the Ohio Players, uh -huh. Mark Adams from the group Slave, uh -huh and Marvin Craig from Lakeside. There were three um, in my top 10. Of right, folk right. Bass. I have a bunch of others too, but. That's but in I, a lot I, of people's I, top 10. Them three are in a lot of people's top 10 right there. I'm telling you now, that's <laughs> the funk. Of course you got Bootsy, you got Larry yeah. Grant, come on, brother Lewis Johnson. I mean, that's a whole bunch, but the fact that those three were from this medium sized city, yeah. in Ohio, which is a kind of a, a, a factory like town. Yes. Dust blue, blue collar. Place. Yeah. Town, like my city, Rochester, New York, right, right, where I grew up. Right. So I developed a kind of affinity for the town, and then I started to just collect more and more about it and realize, man, you know, we know about, for instance, the story of Minneapolis. Yes. Because of films like Purple Rain and the success yes. of Prince. Yes. But what happens when there isn't a record label that points you to that story? Then the medium-sized cities, the Buffalo, New Yorks, the Rochester, New Yorks, right. uh, uh, Cincinnati's, the Louisville's, the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania's get lost. Right. And right. so the fact that they didn't have a record label that came out of Dayton to kind of harness that identity means that there's a, a gap in understanding the history of funk and the history of black music. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that more bands per capita that were signed during this era of the band. Yeah. Came from Dayton, Ohio, the Ohio players. Wow. Slate, Lakeside, Roger Troutman and Zap. Yes. Wave, Sun, Steve Arrington's Hall of Fame, right? Wow. A, a, a half of the band from Aura, right. right? So all of this is a part of this incredible story that once you get into, that's why I spent so much time finding out about music teachers, finding out about neighborhoods, recreation centers, all these. So the story is about Dayton, but the story is also about what kind of music do we make when there is the availability of relatively good wage working class jobs. Mm -hmm. Talk about hip hop. We always talk about hip hop being born of lack. Yeah. So we'll say, yeah. well, hip hop, you know, they had to do this because they took music out of the schools. Right. Uh, hip hop did this because they're closing down rec centers so the kids had to do their own thing. Right. Hip, so we always talk about hip hop in terms of what isn't there. Right. But if you want to get to an inkling of a sound when a community is functioning, now it's not ideal, it's not utopian, but when you have neighborhoods, mm -hmm. not hoods, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. today's hood was yesterday's neighborhood. Neighborhood, right, right. And so if you want that sound, funk, or the music of self-contained bands, not just yeah. funk, because bands can play other genres too. Yeah. But the band is a unit that captures the kinds of social dynamics that create a certain particular culture. Mm. Mm -hmm. And we jumped over that. So right. when you go to average school, They'll talk about the jazz era, blues, and then they'll jump hip hop. Right, you know? right. They might do a little bit with soul, but they jump over the self-contained band. So my work uh, is really dealing with telling the story of that aspect of how we generate and create music in a local context. Hmm. Thank you for that again. And you talked, we talked a lot about the academic, but you also do your own music. I mean, you, you, you are, known in that space as well. So how do you balance the two? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny because art and intellect uh, go hand in hand together. And in some mm -hmm. respects, I wouldn't be able to say the things that I say in my research about music if I didn't play. So yeah. uh, to talk about, you know, um, a song like Just a Touch of Love by Slave, right? Mm. 
if you're doing it from a field, there's lots you can say. You can say it from any different field. You can say different things about that song. But if you have, having experience of playing in a band means I know the kinds of labor that the engineer had to do mm -hmm. to balance this new exciting voice of Steve Arrington with that nasally sometimes outside of the box sound yeah right i know what it means to have to blend that in with the sweet sultry sound of starlene young in just a touch of oh, yeah. love right so Don't get me singing. that's Don't a get creative me singing. process that's yes. a creative process yes. that i can actually help the reader so the challenge of the dynamism of music Mm -hmm. As beautiful as music is and as much as we love it, all you got to do is give it to an academic boy to make it some of the most boring, dry stuff you'd ever heard. <laughs> okay? Right. right. <laughs> and so my challenge being a musician is how do I make the music jump off the page mm -hmm. where you mm -hmm. read it and you, you're not going to reproduce it, but there's some symmetry between what you craft in written word and the experience of music. That's, mm. that's, I mean, there's some great poets that have done that. Yes. One that comes to mind, of course, is Langston Hughes and what he did with blues. Mm. Right? There's some great poets that do that with other genres as well. But okay. as a storyteller, how do I get the reader to feel what I just explained? The tension, the clock is ticking in the studio. Yes. The engineer has all of this stuff and he has to make split second decisions. And then you find something and you didn't realize that this was magic. Right, right. Uh, and, to, and to trust yourself to know what you did is not orthodox, but it's something special. Yeah. Uh, all of those kinds, that's just me just freestyling on I you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's what I mean by playing and writing about playing. Right. And so I have, um, I have, uh, my, the first song I released was called Last Man. Yes. Uh, there's a video for it that you can see uh, on the African American Studies webpage, uh, History Department, I believe. Hopefully we can get it on uh, social science as well. Yeah. Uh, that's I'm definitely working video. to get that up on uh, each one. It really captures the beauty of everyday LA. Yes. And um, the other song that I did, well, the album that I produced and wrote all the music for is by a veteran black arts poet, Kalamu Yasalam. Mm -hmm. uh, he's right out of that cloth of Amiri Baraka, Sonia mm -hmm. Sanchez, and that whole ilk. And so what I did was I put, I tried to put modern music to his poetry. And his spoken word is not just spoken word as we know it. He's doing storytelling a lot of dialogues. He's even converted haiku yes. into a musical experience. So yeah. that album, Catfish and Yellow Grits, you can listen to that. Catfish on and Yellow Grits. Yep. Mm. Salamu Ya Salam. So I have yeah. that one. And then I have another song that I'm going to be releasing in, in just in a couple of weeks or so. I gave you an advanced copy of it. It will be in heavy rotation this weekend. <laughs> well, thank you, bro. <laughs> it's called Scott Tronics. Mm -hmm. and it's um, featuring a real pioneer and um, powerful um, hip hop artist who's been an independent hip hop artist for many years, has a big follower. His name is Oheni Savant. Mm -hmm. And he is a Pan Africanist. He spent a lot of time in Ghana as well. And his rapping style, he's, he's the kind of rapper that all of the great rappers know. Yes. You, know, you have certain musicians that the top musicians like. He's yeah. the rapper that all the top rappers know and love. Right, so right. I have him on rapping on the song, and he was in town. We just, um, uh, he had a schedule change, and we just spontaneously, he heard the beat that I had done, and we just created it on the spot. Yeah. But the song is a good um, metaphor for what I think about is the meaning and mission of Black Studies. Mm. Because the hook on the song, part of the hook says, um, I fuse metaphysical themes with Ebonics. Mm -hmm. so I use the metaphysical themes as a reference to something that is deep. And Ebonics meaning, it's not literally taken as Ebonics meaning black language, uh, but more accessibility. Right. So that's what I think is the essence of black studies, being deep and accessible. Man, and I appreciate I that. We, 
we um, have to, it's a struggle to do both, but it's yeah. what we have uh, come into existence to do. You took a couple of things at us. Um, you go, tell us about the, the project that's out right now that you can get. And there's two projects that are out right now. That Last Man video. The you, Last Man, you, the song in the video is called Last Man. Yeah, and you and can get that currently on YouTube. I know that at the video. YouTube, out. Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, and that's Dr. Scott Brown. Yes. As artist, one T on Scott. And the other project that's out right now also uh, that yeah. you, you helped, you collaborated on, what's that one? Catfish and Yellow Grits. And the artist's name is Kalamu Yasalam, K A L A M U. Yes. Space Y A Salam, S A L A A M. Mm -hmm. And the album is Catfish and Yellow Grits. Yep, I'm gonna wipe my mouth because that made me a little hungry there. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the title track of the song is a storytelling between a man and a woman who are preparing a meal together. Mm. So uh, if you're hungry now, man, wait till you hear it. <laughs> and then tell us that third one that um, you talked about the, the rapper who's the rapper's favorite rapper. Sure. Scott Tronics is the name of that. And that's okay. S C O T R O N I X X. Scott Tronics, mm -hmm. and the artist is so it's by Dr. Scott Brown. Yes, the song is called Scott Tronics, and it features Oheni, O H E N E, space Savant, okay. S A V A N T. So we gave you a lot. Of, we gave you a lot of work there. So got a lot, a lot, a lot of funk to dig. That's right. We, that's right. <laughs> So in this moment, you know, we got a lot going on. Um, we've got what, you know, the decision that just came down as it relates to um, Sandra, uh, um, Brianna Taylor. And we've got a lot that is happening in our, in our world, in our societies and in, in our homes uh, with the pandemic. How do you, you know, when you're creating music, how do you, do you connect it to the moment? Do you, do you connect it to what's going on? How do you see yourself really kind of playing in that space? Absolutely. And, and it's not just music. It's my writing. It's my mm. work. It's, you know, trying to support activists in the way that I can. And, uh, you know, there's so many dimensions to what we need uh, to try to bring into reality this thing called liberation or freedom mm. we're all struggling for, and, and it changes all the time. Yes. But the violence, um, the assaults on our community, the, the violence that, have permeated, that permeates American life, all those things require uh, the contribution of people from a very diverse areas of expertise. Yes. So, you know, my work is one thing, um, if you're talking about music that, that celebrates black people loving each other, you know, that's, that's part of the struggle too, because part of what racism does is devalue and dehumanize people. Yes. And black lives matter. There's a revolutionary aspect to that, yes. that the society has to be transformed in such a way that it ceases to impose its violent devaluation of black life on mm -hmm. us, right? That's mm -hmm. a revolutionary call. There's mm -hmm. also, and from my work in the 60s, there's also a cultural revolutionary side, which is how do black people, how do we see and work uh, with each other? Yes. Now, there are people who have talked about uh, post-slavery traumatic syndrome. Um, I actually don't think you have to go that far back. Right. I think you can deal with COINTELPRO. Yes traumatic syndrome. That is, right. once we've seen Dr. King, um, Malcolm X, Angela Davis, yes. um, so many revolutionaries, uh, Kathleen Cleaver, either get killed, Fred Hampton, or uh, be incarcerated or have their lives totally derailed mm -hmm. because of their commitment to revolutionary change, that actually puts a very clear stigma yeah. that can associate radical change or fighting for freedom it doesn't even have to be radical. Yeah. Actually. Uh, it can just be basic reform right. that you're fighting for. Right. And once people see that the consequence of that is to have your leaders and these folks have their lives derailed, it does impact the choices that we make. Definitely. So, so much of what we're struggling for is 
reevaluating for ourselves mm -hmm. what it means to be consistent, what does it mean to contribute, but also the sustainability of it. So yeah. that's why people are now thinking about other aspects of struggle. They're bringing into the mix things like self-care. Right? Yeah. As yeah. part of the whole, you know, potpourri of things that we have to do to enact and fight and succeed in bringing yeah. about liberation. So the cultural piece of Black Lives Matter, from my perspective, is really about what Black folks do with each other. How do yeah. we talk with one another? How do we work together? How do we build trusting and lasting relationships with one another? And the revolutionary aspect is, you know, fighting the wider world and those relations uh, of power as well. And yeah. you can't, you can't, I, and, and I'm, the only reason why I'm even talking about them separately is because the first book I wrote kind of, there's a language of a binary between culture and revolution. In reality, you have to have them all seamlessly working together. Definitely. And, you know, I, I see it in your work. You know, I, I've had a chance to see the last man video and I can see you, the intentionality behind, you know, the things that you put into the video. You know, there's the music, which is beautiful. And, you know, you have the brilliant Dr. Breon Bain in the space yes. as well, who does an right. amazing job. But, you know, I see the intentionality behind it in the, the spaces you chose here in Los Angeles to, you know, kind of highlight in the video. And then the the fact that you have such amazing representation of black women in the video. When I watch it, I see your intentionality. Am, am, is, am I right in assuming that or is that just... You're very right. You're very happened? right. But, you know, that intentionality also comes out of who... I work with in the creative process. So it was very important for me to work with a black production company, Ultra Wave Media, um, which is um, led by Greg Everett. And that's the same media company that gave us the study of the uh, Black Panther Party, uh, 41st and Central. In mm -hmm. fact, um, uh, filmmaker uh, Everett has done a lot. He, he actually worked on the Tupac video, Hit Him Up, and he's got a long record. Yeah. But he's also committed to a kind of art that captures a, a progressive idea, a revolutionary ideal. And so some of those cultural uh, products come out of these choices that we make. And mm -hmm. some of these choices may not even be in the short run to make the most financial sense. Right. But, uh, sometimes, though, those choices have everything to do with what you come up with. And so... Right. He listened to my vision. We worked through it. We, we were working on it for some time and we got it to that point. Well, I tell you, it's, I'm just thankful um, that I get a chance to, you know, associate with, you know, brilliant brothers such as yourself. And I want to let you know next time, you know, you're putting together a video. If you, oh. if you need somebody to bring the trumpet oh. out, you know, just, just oh. let me know. I'm, I'm ready for you. I ain't holding it right yet, but I'm going to get there. Yes, sir. But you know, yes. when you're ready, just you know, just call me up and we'll, we'll be ready to go. <laughs> Featuring Otis Noble, watch out. See what I'm saying? Dr. Yeah. Brown, you know, appointments in African American studies and history here at UCLA. Thank you for your time. Thank you for what you're doing.